one of the important questions is that after you know after the the, the grape strike was won and, and the growers um, largely agreed to elections and the UFW did very well in those elections. Um, the union never really was able to capitalize on this. They had lettuce strikes and things like that afterwards. They got the Agri California Agricultural Labor Relations Act passed. Uh, but the union um, never really was able to build on the, on the, um, on the success of the grape strike uh, in the late 60s and, and, and early 70s. And there are various, you know, there are there are a couple of competing interpretations. The union consistently says that the Teamsters used methods of violence and intimidation uh, to win a number of union elections. And then once the once the Teamster union won the election, they really didn't care that much about the welfare of the union. They basically sold out to the uh, to the growers. And certainly the Teamsters were um, at that time. Um, you know, a very powerful union, uh, and and were not above using a lot of violence and um, and methods of intimidation. So that's one reason. Um, within the last ten years or so, uh, a couple of, um, of books have have focused actually on Chavez himself, um, and said that his own particular weaknesses uh, were were a significant contributing factor to the um, to the um, the fact that the union was unable to, um, uh, to to build on its strength. Matt Garcia, who at that time, uh, that's the book on the left, was at, um, I believe, Arizona State. I think he's now in, at uh, Dartmouth. And Miriam uh, Pavel, Powell, I, I'm not sure how she actually, let me move that over there. How she, um, um, whoops, let me, can I do this? There we go. I'm not sure how she pronounces her um, uh, her name there, um, the Crusades of Cesar Chavez. Both of them argue in different ways that um, Chavez never realized that the skills and the abilities that he had uh, in terms of organizing were not necessarily transferable to running an organization. You know, so once you win, then there's a whole bunch of other skills that that are needed. You know, skills of delegation and skills of uh, accommodation and skills of negotiation, you know, to keep your organization together, to pick your battles and to do all of those sorts of things that, um, that Chavez apparently proved, proved that according to um, Garcia and Pavel, uh, proved very difficult for Chavez to, uh, uh, to do. He also got involved in Sinanon and, and things like that and, and became, uh, according to these people, kind of um, um, in, in, intolerant of criticism, you know that that sort of um, that sort of thing. Um, so they argue that the kinds of you know, and, and if you think about at the at the video, who did the first negotiations in 1966 with uh, with Shenley? It wasn't Chavez. It was Dolores Huerta, who had been a school teacher, you know, who knew how to organize things and how to prioritize and things like that, and and um, she proved to be a very effective uh, uh, organizer, but. Uh, 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 Chavez himself; those 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 qualities were not, according to these two people, part of his um, his set, and his his refusal to allow other people to kind of take leadership roles in the union was one of the things that contributed to it. For for whatever reason, um, the union that was never really able to build upon the um, the uh, the success that it uh, that it got. However, Chavez as a symbol is like super, super important uh, for, the, um, uh, for the development of the Chicano community. And I'm going to take this off and put this, I've got another little uh, a video segment here, so I'm gonna take off my earplugs and put them next to the, right there. But in mid 1960s Los Angeles, the largest Latino community in the United States seemed destined to remain in society's underclass. 130,000 Mexican Americans were attending LA public schools, but their graduation rate was one of the lowest in the country. It had been that way for generations. 
at Belmont High, Sal Castro, an East L.A. native, had landed a job teaching social studies. After only a few weeks, he noticed something about the student body that concerned him and approached the principal. I said, Mrs. Lord, I still remember her name as Mrs. Lord. You know, there's a lot of Mexican kids here. They're not in student council. They're not uh, participating in, 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 in some of the academic programs. What, what's going on here? She says, you know what? You know, the kids are participating. I says, no, ma'am, that's not true. You know, I'm concerned about this, Mr. Castro. She says, let, let me check. So then, then she calls me back. And, and she says, Mr. Castro, <coughs> look, Mexicans have a, 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 a very charming passivity. You wouldn't want to take that away from him, do you? Castro was disheartened, but hardly surprised. The situation in the school seemed all too familiar. <laughs> when Sal was only two, in 1935, his father had been forced to leave L.A. and return to Mexico. One of about half a million Mexicans and their U.S.-born children deported during the Great Depression. The idea was that Mexicans were causing the depression. People were out of work because of these goddamn Mexicans. So they started, uh, they started rounding Mexicans up. With his family divided, Castro spent his childhood going back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. before attending school in East Los Angeles. As I came back up to the United States and started school here, I spoke mostly Spanish, and the teacher could not understand me. So I sat in a corner. They were even swatting kids for speaking Spanish. And worst of all, your parents spoke Spanish. Maybe there was something wrong with your parents. That's really, you know, that's really a, a psychological whipping that these folks did not understand. Or if they understood it, they didn't give a damn. Now as a teacher, Castro could see that little had changed. Most Mexican-American students were directed away from academic classes and into vocational training. When I was in high school, I was asked, uh, what does your father do for a living? And I said, well, he works with his hands. in construction, cheap labor, pick and shovel kind of job. And uh, she told me, she was a white woman. She told me, oh, that's a very honorable profession. You should follow your father's footsteps. I was told specifically in a geometry class when I got up to ask a question, oh, Paula, why are you even bothering? We all know you're not going to go to college. You're going to be pregnant by the end of summer like the rest of your girlfriends. Every year, about half of all Mexican-American students in Los Angeles schools dropped out. Barely one in a thousand attained a college degree. Castro set out to transform these dire statistics by instilling in his students a sense of pride. He made me feel like loving Mexican culture and our own heritage was actually cool. And that was, that was both unsettling and revolutionary and, and exciting. As students learned about Mexican-American history and the indigenous roots of their culture, many began adopting a new name for themselves, Chicano. When we identified with the word Chicano, our understanding of the word was that it was the same word that is the root word for Mexico, which was the name of the Aztec Indians. And their name was Mexica, not Aztec. That's what the Spaniards called them. Mexica. And you drop off that weak first syllable, me, and you get Chica. That becomes Chicano. Mexicano. And that's who we were. With this new awareness of identity came a heightened sense of self-worth, which Sal Castro reinforced. What he was able to do with his students was to give them a sense that they weren't the problem. It was the schools that were the problem. And when they began to understand that in the dialogue that they would have with Sal, both in and out, of the classrooms that empowered them. So we started to get that there was something wrong. And we were looking at the African-American civil rights movement. And we understood that it wasn't their civil rights movement. It was a civil rights movement. It included everybody. By 1967, 
with Martin Luther King organizing in the South and Cesar Chavez organizing in California. Sal Castro began looking for ways to organize students in East L.A. I went to see my father, and I said, uh, what do you think, uh, Dad, what do you think I should do? He says, huelga, mijo. <laughs> huelga, that's all he said. Castro determined to organize a huelga, a student strike of as many schools as possible. Students drew up a list of demands that included having classes in Mexican-American history and hiring more Latino teachers. Castro enlisted recent graduates to help. He said, there's kids today in the schools that I'm teaching that are going through the same experience that you guys did. They lied, and he said, and I want your help to bring it to a stop. The word started to circulate. slowly planned this out, campus by campus, over a six-month period. And we set a date, March the 6th, 1968. I was scared, excited, nervous. My mother told me, I'll meet you in front of school. Look for me. So that really empowered me. And I got to Lincoln High School, and I knew that others were at Roosevelt. We had all coordinated, and others were at Garfield, and some were at Wilson. Belmont was ready as well. I remember being really nervous and not knowing, can I do this? What if I'm the only one who gets up and do this? Can I really do this? And, you know, the time came, 10 o'clock, and I rushed on the campus, and nobody was walking out. And I started yelling up and down the hallways, walk out, walk out, walk out. I stood up and walked out of the classroom. I was afraid to look behind me to see if anyone else was coming. And then the door started to fling open. And the students just rushed out. footsteps all coming down the stairwell where I was. That was exciting. All I remembered was, okay, I gotta go to the front gate because that's where mom is. And there she was. As all of the students came out, picketed Lincoln High School with my mother. Over a thousand kids, you know, we're, we're out there. And, and the more we march, we, we, those of us in the front would look back and, wow, look at all, look at all these kids. And the parents were coming out and joining them. It was a very emotional time for me. Damn, it was, it was beautiful. By the end of the day, March 6, 1968, some 10,000 students had peacefully walked out of four East Los Angeles high schools. But tensions were high in the city. Race riots had erupted all across America the year before. And when students at Roosevelt High School walked out, police officers were sent to maintain order. Things soon got out of hand. The next thing we knew police started rushing us, and they were waving their Philly clubs, and it was as ugly a thing as I remember in my life, people being clubbed down to the floor because they wanted an education. The next day, we walked out again, and we walked out again the next day after that, and we didn't stop for two weeks. We are not going to... The walkouts eventually led to meetings with parents and administrators, and many of the students' demands were met. You started having brown faces. You started having more Mexican administrators, more bilingual administrators. And sure enough, we eventually started having superintendents. The decade of the 1970s would see more Latinos attending colleges and universities across the country than ever before. 
eventually established Chicano and Latino studies departments at over 160 universities. But perhaps the greatest transformation took place within the students themselves. Before the walkouts, the word Chicano didn't have the charge of claiming our identity in the country and saying, yeah, I'm an American, and that means being a Chicano. After the walkouts, being Chicano meant that you were going to stand up for who you were and own it. And, and one of those, uh, the, the point of, of that is that that's probably the greater legacy of, of the farm workers movement. The, the notion that the uh, Mexican American community could organize and could in fact, where's my, there it is, could in fact, building upon some of the strategies of the other movements um, that, that were there, um, so, for example, this is uh, in L.A. about 1970 or so. These are a group called the Brown Berets. And, of course, it's, it's modeled after the Black Panthers in terms of their uniforms and the berets and everything like that. And as the, uh, as the video indicated, part of the, uh, part, part of the impetus for the, 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 the walkout in L.A. and part of the impetus for uh, Chicano power and things like that was based upon the black power movement that we talked about a couple of weeks ago and that was very much part of the of the Black Panther Party. Um, this is a great thing. Uh, another, another way in which the movement, you know, this is the Oscars in 1970. You know, why do you treat us with bad and degrading roles on the screen? Uh, that's the kind of a thing that, you know, this, this thing has a spillover effect into a number of different um, uh, social areas just like the uh, uh, just like the um, the African American civil rights movement has spilled over into a number of other kinds of things as well, uh, and this is an, an interesting thing. The anti-war movement becomes some people uh, from the that movement get involved in the anti-war movement as well. So I think that the, the 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 one of the most significant legacies of the farm workers movement is not the um, the failure of the union to 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 really be a, a lasting presence in the field, but what it did for uh, Mexican-American uh, communities uh, in uh, California and what it did in terms of helping give them the impetus and, and some of the tools uh, to organize uh, as, a, uh, as a community and as a distinct kind of identity. So that concludes pretty much the first of our three lectures. Thank you very much, and I will be back with lecture number two.